one slightly closer uh, to me. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Peter Gray. I'm the director of the Institute of Irish Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Irish Studies Research Seminar. Again, this is another blended uh, event. So we have some people here in the room, and we've got lots of people uh, out there online uh, through Teams. Um, so uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions in whatever format you're joining us uh, in uh, later on. I'll explain how to do that online if you're not familiar with Teams uh, once we've had our presentation. So it's a great pleasure for me to um, introduce today's speaker. Sorry, but just before I do that, I should just remember my housekeeping um, uh, uh, announcement. Just if you uh, are joining us online, if you keep your microphones muted, um, that means we won't get feedback. Uh, and also we are recording this session. So uh, if you don't want to appear on the recording, if you're worried about that, just turn your camera off uh, and then you'll be quite safe. So um, as I say, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome today's speaker. Uh, who has come all the way from um, further up University Square <laughs> in Queens. Um, uh, Dr. Amy Prendergast uh, is, the, uh, is a Maris Glodowska Curie Individual Research Fellow um, uh, at Queens in the School of Arts, English and Languages, working on um, a project entitled Textuality, Place and the Self, Reimagined Life Writing Through Women's Diaries from Ireland, 1725 to 1810. Their research interests are in the long 18th century on women's writing, Irish literature, um, transnational studies and life writing. Her first monograph, Literary Salons Across Britain and Ireland in the Long 18th Century, was published by Palgrave in 2015. And this examined the important role played by salons in shaping literary culture while both creating and sustaining transnational intellectual networks. Uh, Amy was uh, previously uh, uh, a teaching fellow at Trinity College Dublin from 2016 to 2020 and before that worked as a research associate at Marsh's Library in Dublin uh, and on that team based archival project uh, uh, she was involved in the production of a scholarly edition of the diary and accounts of Elias uh, of Elias Boharu if I've pronounced that correctly hope so uh, published by the Irish Manuscripts, Manuscripts Commission in 2019. So it's great to have uh, Amy with us here in person today. She's going to speak to us about her research uh, on Irish women's writing. And as you can see from the slides, and please shout out if you can't see the slides, but they should be available to you now. Um, she's going to speak to us on inhabiting and creating the diurnal environment, place and identity in women's diaries from Ireland in the long 18th century. So I'm going to pass over to Amy. I can stay here. Are you sure? Okay. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining me online and in person today. So exactly as, as you've just said there, um, today's talk forms part of a larger project that I'm working on, on women's diaries from Ireland from around 1760 to 1810, which looks at archival diaries from across Ireland. Um, so from repositories across Ireland, UK and America, as well as with those that have found their way into print. Um, it includes diary, diarists, um, around over 30 diarists from Ireland, with some of them writing just very short diaries, while others such as Mary Ledbetter have up to 45 volumes. So today's talk uh, was just going to look at a, a selection of these, a few case studies, um, looking at place and identity in the diary. So Irish diaries from the long 18th century are written across many different physical um, environments, encompassing numerous counties and provinces, urban and rural settings, composed both from within Ireland and abroad. Almost all of the diaries include some form of domestic travel and a circulation of people across space, frequently from Dublin townhouses to country estates and family domains. The environments depicted shift from featuring marine and coastal landscapes, boglands and mountain ranges to anthropocentric townscapes and sculpted domains. Today's paper will explore and dissect aspects of the physical landscapes the different diarists inhabit, as well as the curated landscapes and abstract holdowns they create within their diaries, reflecting on questions of place, community and identity, and considering how the diarists both respond to and shape their environments. The relationship between literature and the physical environment is to the fore throughout as the paper poses questions concerning the representation of nature in the diary and what role the physical setting in which the diary is composed plays in the diarist's narrative and writing style. 
This paper posits that the diverse relationship with both their built and natural environment impacts on their immediate employment of language, including narration, pacing, syntax, density of figurative language and tone. We see dramatic shifts in tone take place in certain diaries as the diarist moves through geographical space, particularly from town to countryside, with diarists drawing on the language and tradition of the sublime, the classical pastoral and topographical poetry to convey the landscape unfolding before them. Um, so as I mentioned, my project engages with more than 30 diarists from Ireland from about 1760 to 1810, representing women of different ages, emerging from different backgrounds. And while not all of the diarists by any stretch are from the upper echelons of society, the privilege of many of the studies diarists is certainly to the fore in today's paper, as the extensive leisure time of the landowning class reveals itself through their narration, with seemingly endless disposable hours available to pursue outdoor interests. <clears throat> These interests are frequently enjoyed within various domain settings, and what is most often communicated in the daily entries from the countryside is the direst sensual and intellectual experience of a life behind solid domain walls. So that alongside mountainous terrain and sea views, what we encounter is a domain landscape of cottage and farm ornate, dairies, orchards, manicured walks and gardens. There's almost no allusion to poverty, distress, unhappiness in any of the diaries by the women that survived from this period in Ireland, though the diaries of female international visitors to Ireland are often full of such descriptions. Are these women insulated and isolated from such distresses or are they ignoring reality? This paper proposes that a combination of a lack of comprehension and misinterpretation does coexist with the construction of a paternalistic self-aggrandizing narrative. Andrew Carpenter details how English language poets in 18th century Ireland often closed their eyes to the plight of those forced, forced off the land, maintaining that the countryside was peaceful, for example. One suspects echoes of this um, sorry, in women's diary writing from 18th and early 19th century Ireland. Indeed, it is only in those diaries charting the rebellion of 1798 that we get a sustained engagement with political issues, agitation, and a sense of these people living their lives beyond the domains in the women's diaries. Fanola O'Kane has documented how the perception of Ireland as a picturesque location was created, painted, and manipulated during the 18th century. Similarly, by selecting and rejecting aspects of the surrounding landscape to depict within their diaries, the diarists to manipulate their environment, privileging certain elements in order to produce a curated vision of the world around them. Particularly held up for praise in these constructed environments are the agricultural dimensions of rural life, which are communicated in laudatory fashion, um, often actively embraced and even fetishized by the diarists in almost parodic fashion, producing a very constructed and peculiar diurnal environment, one that I believe is worthy of investigation. So both the main landscapes and the non-human world play a role in the majority of the extant diaries, with intermittent mentions throughout the 78 to 84 and 97 to 1800 diaries of Eleanor Goddard Nay Shuldham, um, a widowed woman, and the middle-aged mother Marianne Fortescue named McClintock, for example. The 1809 to 1810 and 1810 to 12 diaries of Letitia Galloway and Frances Jocelyn are particularly useful diaries from which to explore the relationship between land and identity with both young single women travelling to the County Wicklow countryside from Dublin City with members of their immediate families within one year of each other. Written almost a decade following the Act of Union, which saw many members of the elite relocate to Britain, they both seek to chart their own experiences and impressions of the Irish environment within the diaries, evoking a bucolic setting for their daily narratives, one that is not simply a backdrop, but a presence that informs the structures of their day, their emotions, their sense of self and of community. The diary of Letitia Galloway opens on Midsummer's Day 1809 as she leaves Cumberland Street in Dublin for Crone County Wicklow, where the diarist resides for exactly three months until the 24th of September, afterwards remaining in Dublin for almost the entirety of the journal, apart from the final three days 
when she returns to Wicklow on the 2nd of June before concluding her diary with to be continued on the 4th of June. Described as an actress in the, NLI, the National Library of Ireland catalogue overview, this seems unlikely, but there are no further details extant for the young woman who appears to have died unmarried in 1838. Um, much more information, obviously, survives for Lady Frances Jocelyn, 16 years old at the time of the diary's commencement and at the apex of elite Irish society, substantially higher in status than Galloway. The granddaughter um, of the diarist Anne Jocelyn, née Hamilton, and Robert, first Earl of Roden. She was the daughter of his successor, also Robert, who inherited the Roden estate of Dundalk County Louth and Frances Theodosia Bly of Elphin. Um, <coughs> the, geograph <sorry. coughs> the geographical range of Jocelyn's diary encompasses various estates, notably her own family's Tullymore Domain in County Down, as well as family friends, the Shaw's Bushy Park House in Enniskerry, the Parnell's Avondale House and the Paris Court estate of her own future husband, Richard Wingfield, 5th Viscount Paris Court, who she married in 1813, all in County Wicklow. For the duration of the diary's three years, Jocelyn is more frequently in County Wicklow than in either counties Louth or Down, interspersed with her time spent in Dublin. And now, County Wicklow had become well established as a, quote, thrilling tourist destination by 1809, alongside settings such as the Giant's Causeway, Killarney, Connemara, all of which provided wild and uncultivated landscapes with romantic scenery, picturesque peasants and exotic Gaelic customs. The impact of the Wicklow environment upon the composition of Galloway and Jocelyn's diaries is immediately apparent. Galloway's first full day in Wicklow shows evidence of agency and seven expressions of ownership with an active voice very much to the fore and I quote, in the evening took a walk up the mountains and were delighted with the extended prospect. Every place I bring Mary to see, she is more and more charmed with it. Several laughable adventures on the mountain, such as Mary sitting down in a heap of furs, imagining it to be a seat. An invitation from Miss Arthur to tea, which however we declined, having already walked so much. Went to my favourite cascade with our books, where we sat in a nook, reading till the sun set behind the neighbouring hills. I read one book of Orlando Furioso, Mary has rural tales. Here Galloway established herself as the knowledgeable party, setting the itinerary and taking her sister to locations she herself is familiar with in order for her to share in the appreciation of these sites. The diarist is eager to highlight her prior relationship with the landscape. It is Letitia's favourite cascade that the sisters visit and where they read their books together. She wholeheartedly embraces her role as both tour guide and recorder of events shaping the days and the manner in which the activities are then framed. As so often occurs across the diaries, the full entry opens and closes with weather details, with the day's activities then centre stage. There is a narrative quality to the entry, and interjections and anecdotes are intermingled rather than the reader being presented with a rote list of activities. Um, Frances Jocelyn also connects her reading to waterfall locations, in her case finishing Walter Scott's Lady of the Lake there. Her descriptions of the waterfall itself borrow from such poetry and adhere perfectly to the tenets of the sublime, with her praising it as grand and majestic and noting how it naturally raises one minds to nature's God, what bounties he has bestowed on his miserable creatures. A month later, in County Wicklow, she describes the waterfall view there as, quote, the most beautiful thing I ever saw. The sublime theme continues in the surrounding landscape, with Jocelyn's commentary that, quote, the woods are so very luxuriant and in such a mass, there are rocks and everything that could add to the magnificence of the scene. Throughout this entry and others, Jocelyn tries to capture her sense of awe in her prose writing and to transmit her appreciation of the divine sublime infusing her writing with references to the tremendous and to grandeur. Galloway too continues this emphasis on the Burkean sublime, seeing it within other aspects of nature, such as the contrasting extremes of light and dark. Quote, it was dark except what light we had from a wonder of fine stars. Tina Moran's work on Irish Gothic literature has argued how the Gothic's representation of the country, Ireland, as part of the sublime geographical fringes of the British nation, 
rejects, interrogates and deconstructs prevailing English understandings of Ireland as a marginal zone of incomprehensible strangeness. Ireland's uncivilised, barbarous wildness is repurposed as one element of the sublime, forming part of a wider post-union landscape that is still in the process of being transformed by the improving methods of those at the apex of Irish society and within the country estates. The diaries of both Jocelyn and Galloway echo such assertions, making it clear to anyone who might read their diaries that the sublime is readily accessible in a safe and welcoming Ireland and that they have the skills necessary to discern it. In Galloway's diary also, there is a sense that walks are taken, not just for exercise, as in earlier diaries, but to appreciate nature. Alongside the multiple entries and waterfalls, there are also references to bathing in a nearby crystal stream, or visiting the meetings of the rivers Avon and Owen between Avondale and Castle Howard, which Jocelyn had described as, quote, the most lovely spot I can imagine. Animals play a role in her diary, and Galloway is concerned at the poor health of cows, as well as careful to remark upon the shearing of sheep and the swarming of bees. Um, the diary, so from 1774 to 78 and 78 to 82, of Eleanor Goddard combine the planting of flowers and the sowing of seeds with the raising of birds, for example, quote, bought a canary bird, and set ranunculus, anemones, and sewed mignonette. Goddard's diary included multiple records of her attempts to raise birds herself, from their emergence out of their shells, to their accompanying her to County Kilkenny, their laying of eggs, to her lament the following year that, quote, my bird Pinky flew away and I spent the whole morning in looking for it to no purpose. Galloway's descriptions of her encounters with bees is noted as, quote, a hive of bees swarmed today, quite a new sight to me. This recording is typical of nature journals of the period, those dedicated exclusively to charting the environment. Mary Ellen Belenka describes the declaration of encounter with the never seen or the never heard thing as a widespread pattern in such works commenting that exclaiming over the first time exposure and expression of wonder, a basic response to discovery that serves the diarist in exploring new territories of knowledge. This directly correlates with Galloway's quest for better understanding of her natural environment and her attempts to obtain information about particular aspects of her surroundings, gaining a certain degree of power over what it is she observes. <clears throat> Letitia Galloway returns to Dublin on the 24th of September 1809. From that point on, we notice a stylistic departure and an entirely different texture from those entries composed in the countryside. The pace shifts and the lengthy reflections and commentary cease. The diary written in town allows, allows no space for poetic expressions or descriptions and becomes much more simply a record of which people visit the family or which people were visited. She also takes meticulous notes regarding whoever they missed while they themselves were out visiting. Galloway's whole life now revolves around this circuit of visits, whether missed, early, planned or promised. The romantic inflections are gone, as is the previously omnipresent sublime. The countryside entries evoke and convey a sense of freedom, of autonomy, joy, youth, adventure and shared experiences. We have also noted that visiting others while in the countryside is actively declined rather than sought out. Upon Galloway's return to an urban setting, we no longer encounter either excitement or verve in the diary, just iterative rote evenings that pass pleasantly, but without either hyperbole or excitement. So I have an example on the slide from Thursday, the 21st of December, 1809, just a typical urban entry where the whole day is divided into periods of visiting with life structured around the pattern of these visits, including those not directly involving the diarist herself. The diary entries build upon one another to create a sense of days filled with limitations, both on personal movement and upon creative freedoms. As the entire entries, such as the following, contain no reflection nor attempts at creative expression. She says, Fanny came down soon after breakfast this morning and early in the day, Captain Carter, who is in town, called here to see Fanny and sat about two hours. Godfrey Featherstone dined here again this day. He leaves town in the morning. Miss Hill dines at Mrs. Lawrence's and after tea, my father and mother went to see Mrs. Mansell and left Godfrey, John and I at home. After they came home, we had supper. 
So there are no ruminations on adventurous interludes or personal activities, no playful comments or sense of agency. Instead, the power to shape her day is rendered unto others. In similar fashion, Jocelyn's time in Dublin is made up of a great many visits and some shopping. She herself remarks upon the juxtaposition between town and country, between the urban and rural environments at her disposal. Quote, I've never spent a stupider evening in my life. What the reason is, I do not know. How different to the evenings in Dear Bushy. And the country is charming after the odious town. This charming countryside is contrasted with a series of expressions of disenchantment with the urban that is reflective of the gendered discourse that began to emerge in the late 18th century, whereby the educational and fertility needs of women were declared as being better met in the countryside, which became characterised as containing points of refuge and retirement. These green retreats centred around the domain, which represents the core landscape illustrated across the diaries. Um, the 1798 to 1800 first diary of Marion Fortescue, Lee McClintock, describes multiple visits between her estate at Stevenstown County Loud and nearby Claremont Park, as well as to her father's house at Trumcar, northeast of Dunleer, also in County Loud. Her excursions frequently take her beyond County Louth to County Dublin. And during the rebellion of 1798, and amidst her comments that there is still sad work going on with the United, and her mentions of young men hung or lying dead, the family visit Beth Farnham in South County Dublin, where Fortescue praises the building and its contents, which incorporates a collection of birds, including a golden pheasant. Quote, we went yesterday to Rath Farnham and saw a number of beautiful birds. The place is beautiful. The house has some fine rooms and some fine paintings. <clears throat> the diaries pass effortlessly from one domain landscape to another, commending the beauties to be observed, appreciated and imbibed. There is particular emphasis in both Jocelyn's and Galloway's diaries and the consumption of local produce also. Newton Barry and dined there upon cold meat. And in the evening, we all set out to Colonel Barry's place, which is the most beautiful thing indeed. The garden and shrubbery are charming. We went to a waterfall there is there, a sweet thing. And from Galloway, walked to Paris Court Cherry Orchard, had our book, passed a delightful Mary reading under the shade of a beautiful tree beside a murmuring river, eating cherries and reading Grandison. These encounters with the rural domain provoke a multi-sensory experience whereby the aural qualities of the water complement the local fruits and meats being tasted and the virtual gardenscapes being enjoyed. Sorry, visual, you're in the virtual world here. Uh, the pleasures of immersing oneself into the water and enjoying river bathing is commented upon by Galloway. And the slide, quote, I went and bathed. The walk to the river and back again is one of the most beautiful about here. And as it is all Mr. Evans's ground, we may go in any dress. We never meet a creature. In the evening, we took a walk, a beautiful moonlit night. Galloway here celebrates her freedoms and rejoices in being able to partake of such liberating rituals, attired informally beneath the moonlight, safe in the knowledge that no undesirable strangers will be encountered. However, of course, this freedom for Galloway means exclusion for others. Behind the high walls of the domain, the native Irish find themselves entirely cut off from partaking in such landscape appreciation. The erasure of their presence and the espousal of an exclusively colonial perspective seems to have been fully internalised by the diarists. And as I say, echoes much poetry from, the per um, from earlier in the period. James McElroy has argued that a degree of detachment such as we find in these diaries means that those living within such settings are able to sanction a worldview devoid of wilderness, work and hardship, so the colonial order, in miniature the domain, might serve as iconic representation. Among other things, might minimise indigenous presence along with any native categories pertaining to Ireland's ecological natural space." End quote. The improving traditions in place since the 17th century continue apace in a post-union landscape wherein the descendants of earlier generations of English and Scottish men and women still seek to neutralise the Irish countryside, maximising the resources that can be exploited while ostensibly civilising the local people. When natural, untamed or unconquerable landscapes are encountered by those subscribing to the discourses of improvement, it is primarily in order to regret their presence. 
For all their enjoyment and the thrill of the sublime, this is equally true from the women diarists of the period. Finding herself almost at the top of a mountain with her mother, Letitia Galloway laments that, quote, our progress was stopped by an immense turf bog. Here it is unequivocal, uh, unequivocally the natural unattained bog that is identified as obstructing their passage. The multiple connotations of that word progress chosen by Galloway to describe their time, connected as it is with ideas of improvement, suggests a historical current of amelioration and one in which the Galloways participated. The bogs of the Irish Midlands are frequently bemoaned as impassable, unmanageable, unsightly, and evoked, of, evoked as evidence of Ireland's backwardness from the 17th century onwards. Progress and progressive views can supposedly be impeded by many of Ireland's ecological spaces and the people who inhabit them. We need only think of the insulting phrase bog trotter. Conversely, ostensible improvements and intervention into the surrounding terrain are frequently celebrated throughout the diaries, with landscapes both built and natural functioning as they do to provide protection for the country's elite. The domain walls provide security for the women bathing in the property's rivers, while shelter from inclement weather can also be sought from the structures and trees within these walls, as Galloway comments, quote, proceeded towards the Dargal, carrying a basket of provisions. We were obliged to shelter from very heavy rain in the cottage at Paris Court. We then all returned home, did not get much rain. The fine old trees of Paris Court afforded us shelter. The word shelter is twice invoked here as both noun and verb, and it is clear that the members of the party are protected from either becoming wet or being accosted by others by the domain's boundaries. The cottage mentioned here is one of, one of many cottage or nay that appear across the diaries and indeed that were constructed across the Irish landscape in the latter half of the 18th century. <coughs> Frequently associated with Francis Marie Antoinette, um, O'Kane has shown how these cottage or nay demonstrate human interference with the landscape taming it while simultaneously celebrating the surrounding wildness then in vogue. The cottage was the archetypal rural dwelling and no other building proclaims so effectively its disengagement from the urban environment. The ultimate picturesque constructions, cottages were carefully designed to appear artless and naive. The location of the proposed cottage was of seminal importance, intended to be integrated into the landscape as though belonging to it, appearing entirely natural though an elite man-made intervention, as Galloway's diary entries make clear. Quote, we joined our party at the cottage where we all breakfasted. It was delightful. The cottage is the most charming spot I ever was in, situated by the river with an immense thick wood on the other side. And every here and there, a fine, bold rock is seen among the trees. It is the most romantic place I ever was in. Again, implying the markers of youth with her repeated use of superlatives, Galloway is at pains to convey both the beauty and the appropriateness of the cottage and its location. The wild landscape is celebrated, but now feels tamed and controlled by this human intervention into it, whereby the bold rocks and thick woods are made to support the cottage. This sense of altering, idealising and indeed fetishizing aspects of the Irish countryside in its vernacular for the delights and amusements of the elite is not confined to the construction of cottages. The diaries note multiple socially unrealistic simulacra of country pursuits, buildings and customs and echo the earlier 18th century English tradition of relocating the Arcadian pastoral from the classical period to the present time, wherein the English country estates come to represent a contemporary idyll with representations of nature that strategically omit any sense of elements that might be counter to the positive image. Both women document their involvement in such activities as churning butter before reading, strawberry picking before playing the lute, and engaging with animals on various farms, um, such as that at Dr. McMurray's farm at Avondale and that at Trimcillan, where they observe pigs, horses, and poultry. Their life of escapist pastoral leisure is conveyed in the following entry by Jocelyn, written from Avondale in October 1810, evoking the apples and pears of Theocritus's idylls, as well as the Irish landscape poetry of Wettenhall Wilkes from the 1740s. Quote, after breakfast, as usually, we went into the garden, as F is making a new one. We stood there sunning ourselves and talking, and sometimes walking about the garden and running after the pheasants. The apples and pears are excellent. F and I took a walk down to the cottage to copy some riddles that are upon a screen there. 
but we could not get in and came home to dinner. Spent a very pleasant evening looking over prints of flowers. There's clearly a strong sense of an appreciation of the environs here. Again, the fruits are plucked from within arm's reach, different species of flowers are studied, many pleasant walks are taken, and the autumnal sun shines down upon them all. There are a few brief glimpses into genuine agricultural life, as well as to the customs of the Irish peasantry. Eleanor Goddard's diary mentions patterns in hurling, for instance. There are also fleeting references to a pattern in Awake in Galloway's diary, while she also refers to the belief of others, noting that, quote, this cow doctor is considered by the common people to be a fairy. These common people also become part of the studied landscape. As Carpenter has argued, this side of country life became a form of tourist spectacle designed to enhance the pleasure experienced by city dwellers who went in increasing numbers as the century progressed to the wild places of Ireland to look at the people who lived there as well as to admire the landscape. There's an anthropological dimension to Galloway's comments on these people with investigative tools mentioned in her pursuit of knowledge. There is at last a favourable day, thank God, all hands busy at the hay. We walked up the mountain with our book and telescope. The main outcome of such empirical research is not simply knowledge acquisition or advancement, but the women's own amusement, um, as Galloway notes. Quote, a most delightful morning, sheep shearing commenced, with which Mary and I were highly amused and amused ourselves looking at the sheep shearing, branding, cows milking, and all such country occupations, which were quite new to me. The lives of those often undertaking these country occupations are of course largely unknown to the diarist, nor should we expect them to form part of such elite Irish diaries. There are almost no explicit references to the relationship between the landowning classes and the peasantry, with the exception of a couple of comments lamenting the death of Richard Wingfield, fourth Viking Pariscourt, the father of Francis Johnson's future husband, in which connections are drawn between his life and those in the surrounding area. Upon his death, Galloway writes, quote, Sorry to hear of the death of Lord Pariscourt. He was a charitable good man and will be an unspeakable loss to the poor of the neighbourhood and well named they mourn, for he was a kind landlord. That Powers Court was kind could imply an acknowledgement that all landlords were not necessarily so. There's clearly, clearly an ideological import to the manner in which the landscape is described in the diaries, with the power dynamic of the land possessor to the fore. A paternalistic tone is apparent here as the poor are aided from above by the kindly local landlords who offer protection. The diaries of Galloway and Jocelyn, and indeed Fortescue and Goddard, can be compared and contrasted with extant diaries of two visitors to Ireland. Anna Walker, wife of the Colonel commanding the 50th Regiment of Foot, travelling to Belfast from Portsmouth via Cork and then Dublin from April to June 1802. Um, and an American voice, Elizabeth Quincy of Massachusetts, who visits Ireland in 1790. Walker's diary in particular frequently references the quote, wretched situation of the poor. Kilworth County Cork, for example, is described thus. A miserable place exhibiting only a continuance of mud cabins without window or chimney and the wretched inhabitants covered with vermin and clothed in rags. What is particularly striking in Walker's entries is that the domain landscapes of the Irish countryside are placed side by side with this destitution, which is thereby rendered more stark due to the juxtaposition. Again, in Lachlan Bridge in County Carlow, for instance, Walker notes, the face of the country certainly improves. Hedges are seen to divide the land and here and there plantations. The road very good and several gentlemen's houses embellish the scene, but the cottages of the poor continue miserable. Improvement methods are noted and recognised, including the interventions into the physical landscape through hedgerow division and road improvements, but the homes of the poor remain just as quote, miserable. The ostensible improving touch does not seem to have encompassed their cottages. Similarly, 10 years earlier in 1790, Elizabeth Quincy also remarked upon the juxtaposition of wealth and poverty to be found during her visit to County Dublin. Quote, 
We from the shop took a hack and rode seven miles around the city, through the Phoenix Park, over Island Bridge, etc., and around. The prospect in every direction pleasant, except the mud-walled cottages, which forcibly exhibit the extreme of poverty. These extremes of poverty are absent from the domain landscapes of crystal streams, thick woods, beautiful birds and murmuring rivers depicted by Galloway, Jocelyn, Fortescue and Goddard, whose various diaries evince patterns of similarities in their engagements with their environments and suggest shared perspectives, ideals and values. Reading these diaries in relation to ideas of landscape and the natural world strengthens our understanding of these women's sense of identity, bound up with their recognition of their belonging to a landowning elite, devoted to ideas of agriculture and estate improvement and complementary civilising endeavours. Um, alongside the other factors I explore in my wider research, particularly regarding questions of age and gender, Nationality, religion and class clearly play a key part in the intersectional development of these diarists' personal identities. What is particular to the fore in this respect is the communal collective ethos that emerges. Pastoral literature's emphasis on rural plenty and generous community has long been recognised, understood as a literature of place, of community and of ethos. While such sense of community is traditionally associated with the pastoral's omnipresent shepherds, this focus on invitation and country entertainment is enthusiastically espoused by the occasional residents of the country domains who wish to partake of the rustic feasts, country entertainments, or simply a homely cottage the fictional shepherds enjoy, transposing these elements into an elite setting, but retaining the focus on community and on belonging. Jocelyn's diary in particular mentions multiple country dances and various preparations for a ball, but all four of the diarists discussed here today support a system of visiting wherein the network of extended family and friends is reinforced and upheld through such exchanges. The diaries explored in today's paper display continuities with the politically conservative function of English pastoral literature through its distortions and omission and its ignoring of the actual agrarian processes of cultivation. However, despite the many continuities apparent, these Irish diaries are inextricably linked to specifically Irish concerns and questions, particularly to notions of improvement, land ownership, possession, dispossession, and wilderness. As recent work by Matthew Kelly has made clear, nature was not only the backdrop of events in Ireland, but an, act an active part of a gentle relations with social and judicial factors. The ideological import of both the actions chosen and the descriptions recorded by the Irish elite is consistently apparent throughout the diary entries, which offer a new source for considerations of place and identity. The diarist's perception of their surroundings, their crafting of environments, both within the domains and upon the pages of the diaries, allows us to better understand the self in both an individual and communal context, whereby the diary serves to enforce and sorry, to endorse rather and reinforce the core values of the members of the individual diarist community. <clears throat> the impact of place upon the women's writing is apparent throughout, affecting every element of the diary's form, content and register, exemplifying the myriad encounters and dialogues between people and landscape, with each shaped and influenced by the other for better or worse. <clears throat> Amy, thank you so, so much for that fascinating paper. Um, I'm going to close your slides and then we'll open it up for some questions. That should be it. Yep. Okay, uh, let's just go to the center over here, shall we? Yeah, what have I done? This is where the limits of my control over technology are, are very obvious, right? Okay, right, let's that, that, that's move on to, to Q&A here. 
Great. Okay. So, uh, so if you're out there in, in the ether and you'd like to ask a question, um, there is a little button on your screen that you see a little hand and a face. If you click on that button and then the hand icon, that will just indicate uh, you're digitally raising your hand. Um, and then you can unmute yourself and ask a question. So we've got some people in the room and obviously people online as well. So we can take questions in either mode. Does anyone want to start? Sean? Yeah, that was fascinating paper. Thank you. Uh, it made me think particularly of Ian Foster's rant about English tourists in Italy with their Baedekers, mm -hmm. where they see what Baedeker tells them to look at rather than what it actually shows. But what also struck me was the very strong part, the parallels of what you're saying about Wicklow. Mm -hmm. with, I don't know if you've seen Don Nicholson's book on the origin of the general better imagining the end of time. Okay. And uh, one of us in it because he argues there that the Wicklow, or a particular group of Wicklow gentry, Form a very distinctive um, sort of subculture within Irish elite society. Mm. Um, partly because they're geographically very close to Dublin and therefore they're in a very close touch with evangelical Protestant okay. um, uh, sort of centres in the city. Um, people, like, people like Lady Powers Court, but also that they use the landscape of Wicklow to create a particular okay. narrative in which they are imposing order on mood and nature. And this is a sort of metaphor for the sort of improvement they're trying to produce in society. And it is out of that you know, very uh, particular closed world that the whole bizarre world of the Plymouth Brethren is going to emerge. And of course, the sectors of that more than a generation later in uh, Roy Foster's stuff on Cornell's background, mm -hmm. where again, mm -hmm. he's arguing that there is something special about the Wicked Gentry, that there is a more hard headed, improving culture. Um, in, in that particular that group of landlords. So that, I mean, that should probably feed into your analysis. Of Fantastic. Yeah, lines. wonderful. Thanks so much. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, Mara? Yeah, just very quickly, I have a question which is different. That's very interesting, Sean, because you know, you kind of think if you're going to find a locus of the sublime, Killarney would be, you know, well, why, you know, I was kind of curious about that. But anyway, that's not my question. <laughs> Sorry, I really enjoyed the paper, Amy. I think the contrast with your um, outsider view with Walker and Quincy is really fascinating. So my question is about that really in particular, if you might say something about Walker and Quincy's kind of context and background in terms of intersectionality. I mean, is the difference in view about being an outsider eye or is there something, are they less elite or you know, maybe you could say something a little bit further about Walker and Quincy. And then I'm going to very quickly a second question. Again, this question about sort of outsiders. I'm, I wonder when your women diarists, when they travel outside Ireland, mm -hmm. um, when they are traveling abroad or they're maybe in England or further away, are they also engaging with the natural world or do they reflect back in Ireland? So it's kind of both about outsiderdom. Those kind Absolutely. Of yeah, thanks, Moira. Um, with the second one, yeah, I think, you know, that was kind of forming part of, of this larger chapter, this sense of identity, you know, and what we're seeing today is a lot of communal identity, but there's not a huge sense of Irishness or of national identity, which is what you do get as soon as they leave Ireland. So when I see the diaries written abroad, then you turn to this sense of, of Ireland, of us, of, of what these different things mean that you don't get within an Irish context. You know, when I think of Charity Lecky in Bath and so on. Um, and with, with Charity's one, you do get descriptions in the kind of a sense of a travel diary, but not, not of the natural world as such, but just of each town she visits, where she stays, the quality of the inns, those kind of things in like a more traditional one that you find with the Beauforts as well, when they describe it as a travelogue as such, rather than engaging with, with the sublime and so on. Um, but absolutely, once they leave Ireland, we get much more of a sense of of natu national identity, that they, they are a sense of being an outsider, being seen as different. Their Irishness is constantly to the fore. They're remarking upon how others comment on their accent, on their dress. You know, that that's constantly foregrounded. And I was surprised at how little that is in their diaries. When they are in Ireland, I thought there'd be more from this period on on identity, you know, you can you can craft it and see the threads through, but in an explicit way, it's as soon as they leave that you see, you know, Ireland, Irishness, us, them come out at, to the fore in the diaries. Um, in terms of the first question at Walker and Quincy, yeah, I think there is um, a sense that what a lot of the Irish diaries are doing is Irishness 
you're sorry, celebrating the way I was saying, you know, with the sublime and gothic and and ha saying that it's this wonderful place in which to live in trying to act against the rather negative portrayals that are usually disseminated, that they have decided to remain in this country and that it is a, self, a safe place now rather than maybe 10 years previously. Um, Walker's one is incredibly negative. She's she's relatively happy when she's in Belfast and she has kind of a, an active social life and goes to theatres and amateur theatricals and so on. Um, you know, and she's there as a colonel's wife. So I, I do think there is, a, you know, there is a distinction, certainly in terms of class, but it is that sense of she doesn't feel a need to put Ireland forth as a place that is welcoming and safe to others. She's perhaps, again, I don't think hers is necessarily objective either. She's very, very derogatory throughout, you know, and, and does place more emphasis in general on the negative aspects of, of what she's encountered. Um, with Quincy's, I don't think, I think it, it's, it from my observations she's just a young person traveling around Ireland and it seems you know again it, it, it this is me coming to it with less information about her but it does just seem a candid account of, of what she encounters there's you know it's it's her impressions of her family trip to Ireland and it's it is just that sense of gosh there's a lot of poverty around here but here's also the beautiful places I went to today mm -hmm. but it is that sense of the outsider's view um, and and everyone bringing that um, a narrative to the diary as well. You know that there's always something more being communicated. Yeah. Thanks, Moira. Okay. Thanks, Moira. Uh, so you've got Crawford with a question online. This may also be about the Plymouth Brethren. Or not <laughs> Over to you. In, in fact, it's not. Sean, Sean can relax. Um, Amy, th thank you so much again. Um, as usual, a, a really fascinating presentation. I'm, I'm interested in this idea of the sublime. You've you've used a lot in the paper. You mentioned the Burkean sublime, and you put that in the context of some discussion of some of the reading that some of your diarists were doing as well. I, I'm curious to know where they're getting, what, what is shaping their response to their environment? Are they reading Burke, for example, in the sublime? Are they reading each other? Are they reading, is Gothic fiction helping them think about scenery or, or, or wildness in a particular way? And to what extent is poverty included as part of the sublime? Great, thanks Crawford and thanks for coming along again to hear me. Uh, much appreciated. Um, yeah, so uh, in great news, we do have accounts of what some of them do read, which I love when that occurs. So we know um, with Fortescue that she was reading some travel journals, but she was also reading a lot of Gothic. Um, so that's wonderful because I keep finding the Gothic appear again and again, but oftentimes I don't have hard evidence for what they were reading. Um, again, Radcliffe is always there um, in examples. I'm trying to think of which specific one, but certainly um, we do know, I have around eight, nine of the titles of the texts that Fortescue is reading between 98 and 1800. Um, and there are a mixture of the Gothic and of kind of more traditional travel journals as well. So I do think that they're drawing on that, on kind of on the Gothic, that's where she's certainly getting her examples of sublime. Um, with Jocelyn as well, we do get um, an account of what she's reading. And it's, you know, contemporary novels are an awful lot of them. And again, with Jocelyn's, as I was going to talk about a little bit the, the other day, that, um, you know, she's very candid. And there's no sense that I, I want to put forward that I'm reading these wonderfully deep intellectual histories she's just you know I read this fabulous novel and it kept me up all night and it was wonderful and again it's um I imagine that that is where the sublime is coming from I haven't any reference to any of them reading Burke any of the diarists that I can think of I, but I mean I think so much of the gothic is informed by the Burke and sublime that they're getting it via that and you know with the image I have of Beretti's waterfall and so on that I do think it's it's that sense um, that they're evoking very clearly, and it is that they have gotten it via the really popular Gothic in in the 1790s, and you do see it again and again um, throughout that period, certainly. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Crawford. Well, <clears throat> just probably waiting for more hands to go up. Uh, maybe I might ask a question, maybe. So, is your sense that um, these diaries are entirely personal documents, or are they shared? between intimate friends, female relatives, are, are 
elements from the diaries transcribed into letters and shared mm -hmm. that way as well? Yeah, no, they're absolutely shared. Yeah, so they are, I very, very few of them are explicitly private or exclusively private. Um, there's a sense that they are going to be circulated within the family, that they will hopefully survive for later generations. So they're kind of written for a posthumous audience as well. Um, they'll all have a slightly different tone and certainly the younger diarists, the adolescent diaries are more candid, they're less aware of an audience. Um, whereas the later ones are very much writing either for the women's children or for later generations, um, but very slight evidence of their being exclusively private. Um, again, I was given a talk the other day about how so much of this is dependent on the diaries that do survive that I have access to, so that perhaps there were hundreds of private diaries that that have uh, been destroyed. You know, there are wills extant that say, burn my journal upon my death, it's particularly the diaries from X year to X year. Um, so that what I'm dealing with, I have, again, you know, there's probably roughly a hundred volumes of diaries um, from around, I think I'm currently on 34 diarists. Um, but again, that's I, I, it's so difficult to know how many, unless I see in a will destroy it or in a, in a, a letter destroy it, that it, it's difficult to know what the original corpus of material was. But no, there is that sense of an audience always being in mind or you know people are having nightmares about their diaries being discovered by mm -hmm. a family member when they're young whereas the others are constantly a dear reader or you know i hope if you're reading this in the future and there are annotations to help people understand the diary so an awful lot of marginalia within them that they've gone back and tried to make things clearer to, to later generations mm -hmm. but yeah that's a big part of the project this whole idea of who they were intending to write for as well but nothing is published no not in their lifetimes no, um, there is, you know, there are ones sh shortly after their death and so on. So there's a good few kind of 1840s to 70s by either their elderly sons or by grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a sense that they might be published. Again, with those, it's often frustrating because you don't have access to the original MS. So what was in the in the early ones? You know, Mary Ty is the famous one that we have only what her cousin Caroline Hamilton and her mother Theodosia Blatchford decided to preserve. Mm -hmm. So she comes across as you know, very devout and you know, constantly references to praying and being down upon herself. But then um, Harry Kramer Lincoln discovered additional material that was thought to have been destroyed that gives a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So the kind of the editing decisions, what was decided to be remain. You know, there, there's so many questions about what was the larger the larger picture originally, yeah. but none in their own lifetimes. So. Thanks, Amy. So, um, do we have any other questions? Anyone online like to raise their hand, or if, if you're having difficulty with doing that, just maybe unmute yourself and, and uh, shout out your question. Don't be shy. Who are they? Are they there <laughs> with all the videos <laughs> turned <laughs> off? <laughs> Yeah. I, I see a lot of frenzy names, but no, uh, no faces. Can I ask about wandering off with the book and the telescope? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. So, you know, is this part of sort of amateur science? I or? think so. I mean, I find loads of that in the adolescent mm -hmm. diaries that they're, you know, they have this amazing access to educational tools as mm -hmm. I see them. And there's an awful lot in the diaries of Marianne Dawson about such apparatus and globes are constantly referred to as well mm -hmm. that it's it's this sense of them partaking in the education within a domestic setting you know that Leone kind of works on as well of mm -hmm. the whole material enlightenment within the household and women's intellectual quests within a domestic setting so they are quite proud of that and again of putting it into the diary mm -hmm. that they too are participating in kind of in the, in the way that they have access to it but certainly no I always find that really interesting when there's references to not just books but also to things that their brothers might have had access to as well and that they go then and try and use them yeah. do they record anything that no. they've seen no no they don't not in this one no no and but, but they're they're incredibly meticulous Dawson's one is incredibly so like what she learns on a daily basis, what she reads, you know, what languages she's done, what she's transcribed, what she's translated, you know, that they are 
um, much of the adolescent diaries. It's kind of a mix between incredibly gossipy and fits of fancy, uh, flights of fancy, and then you know exactly what they're trying to learn and how their intellectual abilities are you know should be valued as well. But no, sadly, Moira, no, not what they saw through them. <laughs> Um, please raise your raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. You're right there. So again, hoping that some people will do that. <laughs> um, maybe I, I can ask another question, uh, Amy. So I mean, obviously, you know, I think about um, 19th century diaries, mm -hmm. and obviously uh, for many women's strong evangelical motivations to record mm -hmm. a diary, which, which is a kind of you know, spiritual document. Yeah. Um, are you seeing much of that in the 18th century in your period? Oh yeah, no, there are absolutely no, um, there's an awful lot of spiritual diaries um, out there. I tend to, with the project, to try and put a little bit of um, a limitation mm -hmm. to it. With the spiritual ones, I've read them and engaged with them to a certain extent, but not kind of forming part of the study as such. So what I'm trying to do is look at the more secular ones and the kind of literary elements of them, but they're all in dialogue with one another, absolutely. Um, but no, there's loads. I see Rosemary Rockler is there and, you know, working on Eliza Bennis, um, her great edition of of that one, you know, features in the study, um, as does Mary Ledbetter's own mom, Elizabeth Shackleton's, but they're incredibly, like, they're totally different diaries where it's all about the spiritual quest with kind of the domestic in the background, whereas the ones I'm focusing more on are obviously women who are devout, who are, um, are evangelical and so on, but that their diaries are much more secular, that there's a God is present throughout them and that there are, you know, there's a great degree of intertextuality and dialogue, quoting from sermons and so on, but it's not the, the core emphasis mm -hmm. of them. Equally with the travel di diaries, you know, they feature in the study as well, but those that are devoted just to recording the particulars of a place, you know, they form part of a larger thing that will involve the project, but I try to treat them, three of them as separate. So the spiritual diaries, the travel diaries, and then these kind of, you know, personal diaries that are for an audience, you know, the the, the journal on team and so on but no absolutely throughout the 18th century we see that continuation of the, the spiritual diaries that were so prominent in the 17th century and and the women are all very much aware of that tradition as well and and having that legacy of a, of a previous generation of women writers too yeah. Thank you. can i ask about this you know the, the, the date parameters because when <laughs> you know peter was introducing you it was much yes, longer than <laughs> 25 yeah Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, there's just very little material, 1725 to 17. Yeah, so you just refined that as part of it has been refined, Moira. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, when I had started it, um, I was trying to be as generous as possible so that I could work through the material and then um, go on from there. But it's kind of following on from what we're discussing here, and that I do see a shift mid century to the more secular, mm -hmm. so that the earlier ones from the 20s and 40s are much more spiritual. So they're, for me, they're accounts of Quaker meetings, but it's, you know, and there's great ones from Leash. So I was like, oh, I'm going to know all these places. They're going to be fabulous. Um, but again, it's just, you know, we had this meeting in Castletown, and here's who came, and this is what the sermon was, and this is my response to the sermon. But there's no sense of, anything beyond that of the Quaker community in, in the ones that I've looked at, just sorry, in that particular example. So no, that's that's how it kind of came about that, just in terms of the source material, so that there are still diaries, obviously, from um, the earlier period. 1725 happened to be Ketchia's Sudbury's in the NLI. That was the earliest diary I had kind of included. That was where that had come in. So it was kind of informed by, by that when I was initially um, envisaging the, the project but then having looked at all the different sources it just there was a much more natural split so again i've read the earlier diaries they're there you know they're in part of it but that the focus is much more 1760 to, to 1810 that kind of 50 year period where they're you know before we kind of shift more to to autobiography and there's you see kind of a difference as we move through the 19th century that for this 50 years of kind of the secular diary in the way i'm imagining it very much informed by faith constantly to the fore but describing daily life um it just fitted more naturally but yes so that uh, earlier period it just seemed um 
quite a distinctive one really from from the later. Okay, um, last call uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question. Uh, if you're having technical problems with the <laughs> icon, just, just unmute yourself and ask, shout out. Okay, otherwise, um, thank you, Amy, for, for, for coming in and sharing your research. This is a research in progress. Um, so if, if there's anyone out there um, who wants to obviously to communicate with, with Amy about what she's doing, you're more than happy to talk to people by email. I'm oh, sure. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And all details are online and Twitter handles and emails and everything there. And I was happy to, to chat about them in person and virtually. Okay, so uh, what we might do then is, is perhaps just finish by thanking uh, Amy in the traditional fashion of giving her <laughs> a round of applause for sharing her, her fantastic research with us. So. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. All right, thanks everyone.